First, I would like to thank uh, Andrea for inviting me to give this talk, and, uh, and also I would like to thank uh, Ricardo for setting me up uh, and helping me uh, in terms of the information about this uh, summer school. Um, so the talk that I'm going to give today is basically the uh, PhD work uh, done by um, um, former PhD student Wolfgang uh, Koenig. Uh, he's now back already back to Turkey. And actually, Andre uh, examined this PhD student, so he's familiar with this work. <laughs> um, and this work is also jointly done with uh, Joseph and uh, Mark. Um, and Mark is a postdoc. Um, so the work is about uh, audiovisual multi-speaker tracking uh, with uh, particle and PhD filter. So you can see from the title of this uh, presentation uh, is, uh, is about two uh, different uh, uh, filtering algorithms that we are going to use. Um, but of course we are going to present uh, what exactly different uh, from the, uh, uh, the standard uh, or classical uh, PhD uh, and particle filters. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. Um, is I start from the uh, motivation why we're doing this work, um, and then uh, talk about the um, potential tracking framework that could be used. Um, then we, we're going to discuss um, uh, some work uh, uh, that we have done. One is um, uh, using uh, particle filters, especially uh, adaptive uh, particle filter algorithms by uh, fusing uh, the audio and the video information together. Uh, this is for multi-speaker actually. But in this case, we assume we load the number of uh, uh, speakers. And then we use this uh, uh, random finite set uh, uh, framework for uh, variable number of uh, speakers where we don't know exactly the number of speakers. Okay, and uh, also the first order moment based uh, approximation for a random finding set, which is a PhD filtering. And we're also going to pre present uh, the new, uh, new work uh, based on the PhD filtering. And finally, we conclude and, uh, and uh, oversee the future work. So, um, uh, tracking can be applied to many scenarios, for example, for surveillance. Um, and for games or uh, sports, for example, or uh, for a seminar room type of conference, uh, uh, conference uh, environment, or could be used for face tracking. I mean, depending on uh, your interest and applications, this can be quite wide. But here, our focus is mainly on the indoor uh, tracking for uh, moving speakers. So this could be used, for example, the, uh, one of the uh, projects we are currently working on is uh, uh, sp spatial audio, where we need to uh, capture uh, the, the information about the speakers and the listeners in the indoor environment, and then we use the signal processing algorithm to represent the audio data collected from the uh, speakers and try to, uh, what we call objectification, to represent uh, the audio signals uh, using object-based uh, format. And in this case, we have to uh, use some uh, sensors like uh, uh, microphone arrays or uh, binaural microphones uh, to capture the audio data. And at the same time, we have to use, for example, the cameras to be able to better analyze the room geometry <coughs> or the information in the room, for example, the footage and everything. And this could be then feedback to the uh, acoustic modeling. So it's kind of a fusion of uh, both um, audio and video data. Okay, that's the main motivation for our work. Um, in terms of the tracking framework, um, so basically uh, this could be uh, approximately classified into stochastic uh, framework or deterministic framework. So stochastic framework, uh, for example, particle filtering, and the random finding sets and uh, uh, PhD filters. Of course, there, there are more classical like uh, Kalman filters. So here we're not. Uh, that's not the focus uh, of discussion here. So, and deterministic techniques like mean shift uh, tracking. So, so later we're going to discuss the difference between them. Okay. So part particle filter that. Uh, um, it could be used for nonlinear non-Gaussian uh, models. Uh, and random finding set, uh, for this one, you have to know how many, 
how many speakers, for example, how many targets uh, in, a, in, a, in a room. And for random finding set, uh, you don't have to know uh, the exact number of uh, uh, speakers, but this could be uh, estimated you know, in a framework. Um, but the trouble is that uh, it could be computationally very expensive uh, because the complexity is uh, it's like uh, exponentially grow with the number of speakers that you want to track. So it's basically it's the number of measurements, uh, the, the power uh, uh, to, to, the, to the number of speakers. So it could be very large in terms of, uh, uh, or very heavy in terms of complexity. And the PhD filtering is essentially uh, based on random finding set, uh, is a kind of a first order moment uh, kind of a approximation of uh, uh, the random finding set techniques. And uh, deterministic technique, uh, this typical one, mean shift, is basically is, uh, you use some kind of optimization technique. You, you form a cost function which you try to optimize or minimize, for example. Uh, that uh, is, is, for example, you can form a cost function which uh, check the difference between the target you want to track and uh, some template, or something. and you measure the distance. And you try to um, minimize this type of uh, uh, cost function uh, based on this certain criteria. Um, so now let's uh, talk about the first uh, uh, technique, uh, particle filter. Uh, so, so how, how many people here have uh, already worked on particle filter? Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, particle filter um, um, uh, actually has been quite widely used. Uh, so it's uh, kind of ba based on this uh, BSM framework. Uh, you use uh, this uh, uh, important sampling, uh, basically, and uh, to uh, find the posterior probabilities. And you look for the target positions. Uh, it's like based on uh, the samples you actually generated. Uh, and then you evaluate uh, the probability, the posterior probability, based on the measurement you are actually taking from, uh, let's say, image or uh, video uh, signals, which then finally give you uh, the positions that uh, of the targets. Um, so, uh, so this type of the uh, technique, uh, as, uh, as we show later, that uh, for ratio uh, tracking, we first actually tested this method and, and found that uh, um, this technique, if you use the uh, original uh, particle filter techniques for tracking in an indoor environment. Uh, it could fail in some scenarios, for example, uh, uh, illumination changes, because you have to take a measurement from the image frames, okay? It, depending on the illuminations uh, in the room, uh, the quality of the measurement uh, could be very, uh, is not as high as what you would expect, so which means that it could be noisy, and uh, this can lead to the failure of the tracker. So this is one issue, illumination, and also another issue is uh, um, um, occlusion problem. The occlusion could be caused by the other uh, target in the room, or could be caused by the limited field of view of the cameras. Okay, for example, the target could work uh, out of the view of the cameras. This, both scenarios could be considered as uh, uh, occlusion, and in this case, uh, um, unless you use some techniques that the tracker might be lost after you know, for example, the target uh, come back to the scene. So okay, this this um, uh, a common issues actually. Um, um, so another problem with particle filter that uh, because you're using particles to actually finally come up with the posterior probability, and uh, which means that you use the the number of ta uh, particles is important uh, for the final performance achieved or the accuracy you estimated based on the number of particles. So with a small number of particles that uh, you, the probability estimate might not be so accurate. So this is another um, issue with uh, particle filter. Um, so if you use a large number of particles, you can get better uh, estimation in terms of the distribution. But uh, this uh, also increases the complexity, uh, computational complexity. So and uh, this is the five steps 
um, in uh, particle filtering. So what you do first is, uh, for example, um, in visual tracking, let's say, uh, uh, in our applications, we track the face of the speaker. Okay. So what you do is, uh, um, so the, the, the state uh, vector we wish to track it contains the position of the face, as well as uh, the horizontal and the vertical uh, velocity of uh, the uh, you know of the position of the face for example if you say the position of the face is uh, indicated by the horizontal and the vertical axis x x1 and x2 then you have got the velocity um, of x1 and x2 together with uh, the size of the let's say uh, rectangle you actually uh, uh, you assign to the face area Okay, the, the essentially you check the state vector which contains the um, position of the phase as well as uh, the velocity uh, and the scale right, uh, of the rectangle that you put on the phase. So this is, initially you, you, you could assign some random uh, particles which means uh, a number of such uh, vectors, okay? Because you don't know where the phase is. Of course, in practice, you could uh, manually initialize that you know that where the face is. You actually put a rectangle on the face. That's give you the position of the face. That's like the uh, initial uh, position. But um, uh, but in terms of the particles, that uh, if you want to track, for example, in the next uh, time step, you have to guess. That's like a prediction, right? You you assign. Uh, this is also called uh, um, okay the. Uh, propagating the particles, so by dy dynamic model. So from one time cell to the next, you don't know, so you, you, you use, a, for example, a linear motion model um, to pro propagate the particles to another position together with some uh, random noise. The noise, uh, uh, the, the, the noise actually is um, uh, characterizing the variance in the position as well as the velocity. Uh, of the particle and, and, uh, and also the scale of the particle. And then what you do is uh, you weight the particles by the observation model, uh, which means that for uh, each particle, because you know each particle corresponding to a particular position in the image frame, so from that particular position you take uh, a rectangle of image, image patch, and then you calculate some features, for example, that's called a measurement, like a um, color histogram, whatever, yeah? Depending on what type of features you want to calculate. So basically you calculate these features and uh, that gives you the observation information that you can fit into the weight. You can uh, modify the weight based on the observation information. And, uh, and after this, you can estimate uh, the position um, and uh, followed by the estimate position, you can uh, you resample uh, the particles. The resampling is basically is to uh, you know to remove uh, some small weight at the same time to uh, to resample uh, uh, to duplicate the large weights. Uh, this is the uh, um, you know the animation to explain the idea. So as assuming uh, target in this time frame and next time frame here. And uh, what you do is, uh, this is um, uh, initialized, you know, you have some particles, uh, initialize the particles, uh, propagating particles and uh, resampling particles. This is a resampling particles. What do you do next, assuming this is the uh, target in the next uh, time step, you propagate the particles um, and then you take the measurement at each position where these particles are located. Uh, this gives you the um, measurement or observation information that you can uh, include to modify the weight. Okay? You know, if, for example, uh, the, the particle is very close to the, uh, the true position of the target, then the information you collected from that position would be uh, you know, it's like more similar to uh, the target you want to track. So this gives you a higher weight. Um, so this is a weighting process. And then multiplying the weight with uh, uh, the state of each uh, particle gives you the, uh, the position estimation of the uh, target. Okay? And then you resample. 
you know, to remove the small weights and duplicate the large weights uh, into several uh, wave, uh, particles. That, does this make sense? Yeah? So this is the five steps uh, uh, commonly used. Uh, um, as I said, uh, the performance of uh, particle filter is dependent on how many samples you're using. Uh, at the same time, uh, I mean, how many samples, I mean, how many particles you're using here. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, so of course, in practice, you also have to fi figure out what kind of measurement you're using. Uh, in visual tracking, we could use the, uh, the color information that you take from the position uh, of each particle. Okay? You could use other features, and this can also affect the tracking result. So if you use, uh, uh, let's say, a small number of particles, uh, the tracking areas could be very large. So in uh, our work, we actually were trying to use uh, multimodal information, like uh, the information coming from audio, to enhance uh, visual tracking. So in that case, even when you use a uh, small number of uh, particles, you can still potentially uh, able to track the target you wish to track. So this is the framework of incorporating audio into visual tracking. Uh, again, you have this uh, visual uh, particle filter, and what we do here is we incorporate this so-called uh, DOA information. Of course, uh, what type of audio information could be used? I mean, the framework is uh, quite general. You could incorporate many different audio information, but here we are using uh, DOA information, uh, direction of uh, arrival, uh, or you know, which means that if you have, uh, for example, a microphone array, let's say circular array, you put play place on the uh, desk, then if you have a, an audio uh, um, target somewhere uh, in a certain direction, then you can actually estimate the direction of arrival of that uh, audio source uh, with respect to the microphone array, right? That's you can estimate. This is called uh, uh, direction of arrival information. You could uh, estimate other information uh, from uh, you know, the uh, microphone measurements. Um, here we, uh, as a, con a proof of concept, we use this direction of arrival information, and then you can actually calculate the moment distance uh, using this DOA. It's like actually, after you propagate the particles, you incorporate the DOA information, and then you modify the weight based on the DOA information. Uh, so, th because the DOA information tells you that uh, where uh, likely in the acoustic scene that you have uh, audio sources with respect to the uh, microphone array. Does it make sense? So, it's like you, you have two set of information. Rather than just uh, um, which information, you have uh, audio information as well. Um, what, uh, if, if I use the uh, animation to show the idea, Basically, this is the same as uh, in the original visual particle filters, and uh, you propagate particles. But now, but now you have this uh, DOA. This DOA is essentially uh, uh, the DOA nine. We draw DOA nine. We call it DOA nine. Is is actually corresponding to the image frame because in the image frame you have these uh, uh, microphone array positions as well as uh, the speaker. Uh, the direct direction of arrival information, and then you can draw. Uh, our, this is approximate nine that corresponding to the speakers. And how to draw this nine? We have a detailed description in the paper. So if you're interested, it's on on nine. Uh, basically, we can draw this type of nine on the image frame. And this tells you uh, where is the direction that uh, you likely have this uh, audio source. And then you can actually uh, weight uh, the particles um, based on this DOA and I. It's like uh, you, you, you incorporate this information into the weighting stage in the particle filter. Um, this gives you a better chance to detect uh, the audio sources. Um, okay. Uh, so this is the idea. So it's very, uh, we, we don't have much uh, mathematical details of how this is calculated, but uh, it's all described in the paper. The, the data we used uh, is the so-called uh, AV16.3. 
And we actually also have a look at the, the other potential data set that could be used to, to evaluate the audio visual tracking techniques. Um, uh, but uh, the good thing about this uh, uh, data set is that um, is a room environment it contains some uh, quite challenging uh, scenarios. For example, the illumination and the image quality is not that great. As well as uh, you know, the the lot of movement, uh, quick movement between the uh, speakers, um, uh, and another very good thing about this dataset is they provided these uh, annotations, which means that you can evaluate the quality of the tracker by comparing with the ground truth. The ground truth they already provided in the dataset. There are uh, several other potential datasets uh, available publicly, but uh, they didn't provide the ground truth annotations, which make it very hard to compare uh, between the different uh, algorithms, because you can't tell exactly uh, the ground truth. So well, that's why we're using this uh, data set. So basically, you have uh, three, uh, three cameras and two microphone arrays. Um, the circular array is actually placed on the uh, table in the middle of the room. And this is a, the rough geometry of the room. And uh, so you can see that it's uh, like a... Um, uh, so, so basically, it uh, contains uh, several uh, features which uh, fit very well with um, what we actually are uh, expecting. So that's why we are using here. In terms of uh, the audio uh, detection, uh, we're using the techniques so-called SSM, SEN, same and the spare bean uh, technique um, is actually also used uh, um, um, in that uh, data set. The idea is that because they use this uh, uh, circular array, what they do is the first step, they divide the space into 18 subsections corresponding to these uh, microphones. This is, uh, you know, these subsections the subsection one, two, and here, uh, here is 18, okay? And then for each time frame of the audio, uh, they figure out um, the activity of the uh, audio uh, information um, within the particular section. So this, this is can come up with, finally you get these numbers. This shows uh, how many frames that you likely to have uh, some activities in that direction. Okay, this gives you these numbers, and then this threshold. By comparing these numbers uh, against the threshold, and then you get the binary number here. So, for example, if this is very high, you get the number one. If it's very low, you just zero out. Okay. So, for example, you get this. Okay, these three di directions you you have, you know, potentially you have the source there, but it, it doesn't tell you exactly how many sources from that particular direction. Um, and then in the final step, that uh, they need to detect uh, the exact direction of the sources, which they use this called uh, uh, FET, SRP, FET algorithms uh, uh, to do that. So basically this is the general idea of how to detect the audio sources from this direction to give you direction of uh, arrival information of the audio sources, okay? And uh, this is some uh, video demos to show uh, this is for single speaker and we use um, 10 particles. Uh, this is a visual tracker. Which tracker uh, can feel especially when you know the face moved to this window area and uh, unless you find a mechanism to redetect the face otherwise you will not be able to pick up, re-pick up after you know uh, after the failure. Um, but if you have the, because the, you know, this guy is moving but at the same time he's speaking, so you have the audio information that can uh, enhance this tracker. Um, so this is the two speaker scenario. So again the trouble is uh, coming to the, when the occlusion happens actually. And uh, again, unless you have a mechanism to avoid the occlusion or to re-identify uh, the speakers, uh, uh, then otherwise you you could, uh, uh, you may not be able to repick uh, the trackers that they wish to track. Um, so, this uh, um, figure shows that 
uh, as I already explained earlier, the performance of uh, particle filter uh, is also dependent on the number of particles you're using. Here this shows uh, one of the sequences we tested that if you change the number of particles that, uh, you know, for which are only particle filter, you can fail if you use a very small number of uh, uh, particles. Of course, it's, it's not always fair, but uh, it can fail is, you know, in some sequences. And, but if you use the audio information, that can somehow compensate and uh, uh, mitigate this issue. And this is for another uh, sequence. Uh, again, we tested it uh, for uh, the different number of uh, speakers. Um, this is for two, uh, I think this, oh, this is still for one speaker scenario. Uh, this is for two speaker scenario. Okay. Um, and here is a demo for three speaker scenario. It looks like uh, it's a simple case because uh, two of them are not moving, and only one is moving. Uh, but when they are not moving, it's also you know it's problematic because you don't have uh, the information to to give you that uh, 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 to predict where the speaker is uh, static uh, over their certain positions. And this shows that um, uh, the or the visual tracker in terms of the errors. Again, we're using ten particles in this case. And this is the average error. Of course, this error is measured based on the image pixels. I mean, uh, it's not uh, the uh, distance in centimeters or whatever. Okay, this is another camera where, where you can see that uh, uh, how they move and uh, cross over. Uh, and uh, the, the trouble is here, you know, sometimes the face can be lost uh, in a window area and, and also when they cross over each other. And this shows the aggregate errors. Um, is, uh, uh, these errors are actually measured in terms of uh, you know, we actually add them together along these uh, frames and, uh, and normalized by the frame number. This shows a uh, more smooth curve actually. So that's, that's uh, the, uh, what we have uh, demonstrated, actually using audio information that can help to address uh, problems, uh, for example, when, you, uh, when the occlusion happens or when the number of particles is not uh, big enough to, for the particle filter to work properly. Okay? So as we uh, discussed, that, uh, the number of particles uh, uh, could be important for uh, the performance of the particle filter. So how to determine the number of particles that you can use? Uh, many people just choose uh, artificially by set a fixed number, right? You can set a large number, you could also set a relatively smaller number depending on the applications, how accurate you want to achieve, and uh, the, and the trade-off with the computational complexity. Yeah? And here we, uh, uh, we uh, develop a technique uh, to uh, depthively estimate the, uh, the number of particles that to be used in the particle filter. Um, of course, uh, there is an existing technique called uh, KLD sampling that uh, already uh, was doing this job. Basically, uh, what they're trying to do is they estimate the number of particles by uh, bounding the error, the tracking errors. Okay. Um, but uh, one of the limitations with this technique is that they, 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 they fix the, um, the variance. Uh, actually, the variance uh, determines uh, how far the particles are actually up, uh, apart from each other. So, so, this, uh, so in our uh, algorithms, we try to adapt both the number of particles as well as the variance uh, and then by bounding the tracking errors. Okay? So th this is the idea of a KLD sampling. So the, the what, what is uh, the key idea behind, uh, behind 
carry sampling. The carry sampling is try to actually approximate the posterior property probability by using a so-called uh, discrete, uh, uh, discrete um, piecewise constant distributions. Okay, so it's like uh, in here using this so-called uh, uh, chi-square distribution. Uh, and then you can actually fit with uh, the posterior probability distribution. And what you need to do then is this is the number of uh, particles, and uh, this is chi square distribution here, uh, one uh, minus uh, uh, delta, which is the, uh, the, the, the uh, one quartile of this distribution with the degree of freedom b minus one. So the important uh, parameter here is the b is the number of bins that you can use. Uh, to approximate that distribution because it's essentially it's like a, a, a number of beans uh, you come up with a histogram and uh, this uh, epsilon actually is, uh, uh, tells you the, the errors uh, this is also s set uh, uh, in, uh, in, in practice actually so basically what you do is here is you come up with this type of equation this is based on uh, Wilson uh, have to transform uh, looks like it's a complicated uh, equation, but essentially the key parameter here is uh, B. So B is the number of bins that you, you are using uh, that, uh, that is used to estimate the number of particles uh, uh, that you should use uh, in order to uh, uh, bound the errors that you want to achieve. Um, but as I said, the KLG sampling actually uh, uh, the, um, uh, the one of the issues is uh, uh, the number of beans, how to choose the number of beans, uh, how to figure out the number of beans. Uh, and, and another issue is uh, how to determine the, uh, the variance. So it's choosing artificially. So here we try to um, uh, adapt um, based on the, the errors we bounded and also the relationship between the number of particles, uh, as well as uh, the variance, um, we, we, we come up with something like this. So assuming that uh, this is the, the area occupied by the particles, okay, we, we, we call S, this is a total area by this um, blue box. And uh, you also have an area for each particle occupied by this rectangle, this is air, okay? And uh, sigma square is essentially the density or, or the variance. Um, the variance basically determines how far the uh, particles are from each other or how much they are overlapping with each other. Okay? And n is the number of particles you can use. Okay? So uh, here, this, this is a kind of the formulation that uh, this, the, the area is dependent on these three parameters. Okay, but uh, how mo what is exactly the formulation is still not unknown. And what we, we did is that uh, we used uh, some um, uh, extensive tests to find out the relationship between them. And what we did is uh, we fixed the uh, air, you know, the, the rectangular box for each particle, and then figure out the occupied area, and the relationship between the occupied area uh, with respect to the variance, yeah, sigma square, and for each n, so n equal to five, for example, five particles, and uh, for n here is a uh, one hundred particles. Okay, then you come up with something like this. It looks like linear lines, but essentially it's, it's non-linear. If you look closely, this is not a linear function. And uh, to exactly uh, characterize these functions uh, is, is not uh, easy. So what we did is uh, we, of course, this is for one particular error. And you can come up with uh, a number of, uh, you know, we call it uh, mapping tables. Okay, we show here as a plot, but basically you have this type of lines. But how to actually describe these lines or the relationship between the number of particles and uh, the occupied area? and uh, the size of each particle, the each rectangle of this each particle. And uh, what we did, we used a so-called um, co-fitting. So co-fitting, that's, you know, that's a nonlinear function. We use a three order and third order uh, the po polynomial to approximate the, the relationship between 
S and uh, N, sigma square and L. Okay, does it make sense? So of course, then you have to estimate the coefficients. This can be found from, you know, the mapping tables that we have already created. Well, that's based on the random, random uh, test we uh, we did. So we can find these uh, parameters. They give you this polynomial model. And, uh, and then from the polynomial model, how to estimate the... But basically, the key idea is, given this, this relationship, then you, you can see here, this is n, the number of uh, particles. This is sigma square, and the s and the r. So with this coefficient, and then you can calculate n automatically based on this equation. I mean, how to calculate that we have described in papers. But basically, you can do this. Um, and uh, I just show you some plot to show the result here. For example, uh, what you do is this is a bounding error, which means that uh, you fix the, uh, 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 the uh, gamma. This is a parameter that tells you how much error you would get. And uh, then you can see that if you use this um, um, adaptive for particle filter, then you can use a uh, much smaller number of uh, particles as compared with using uh, the particle filter algorithm, the fixed particle filter you know, without adapting the numbers. So, so which means that uh, if you use the fixed number of particles, then you, you, you know, um, uh, you have to use more uh, because you're not adapting to the, 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 the variance here. So basically, um, this means that using the adaptive techniques that uh, can uh, lead to smaller, on average, a smaller number of particles and without uh, sacrificing the tracking accuracy. So this is a um, performance, uh, um, absolute errors, uh, mean absolute errors based on this is a comparison between the visual particle filter and the audio visual particle filter we have uh, explained earlier. And uh, this is based on um, KID sampling uh, technique and also the techniques we used, okay, the comparison between them. This is the uh, average result. And this is a test for each of the sequence uh, in the every 16.3 data set, okay? So this is a work about uh, particle filter. Actually, I, I think I'm overrun now. Uh, but in terms of the, we have uh, already published the code. If you like to test, uh, is is online now. So, so this se second part of talk, because I'm running over of time, I have to run a bit quicker. Uh, the second part of talk is about uh, tracking variable number of uh, speakers which means in this case you have to estimate both the number of speakers as well as their states, okay? Um, this is, a, we're using this uh, random finite set uh, framework. So the random finite set framework, uh, so, uh, so now instead of having, you, you know, having this uh, each speaker state that you wish to track, um, now you have uh, this so-called random finite set. Here, k is a time step, and uh, this sigma k is actually the number of target or number of speakers that this has to be, this needs to be estimated. And then you have uh, um, particles, uh, the three different types. Okay, for example, this so-called uh, survival speaker uh, and uh, spawned uh, speakers, and uh, this is the newborn speakers. Okay, actually, you cut, characterize uh, uh, the different type of uh, uh, particles based on the different uh, uh, type of status here. Okay, so in our case, the measurement is taken from both uh, video signal as well as audio signal. Okay, and this is a full set of measurements. And again, the idea is very. Uh, it's very similar to the particle filter. Of course, for random finite set, uh, uh, we have uh, actually also tested for this data set, but we found that if you use uh, the two speaker uh, or the video sequence, uh, it's okay, the complexity you can manage it, but if you use the three or more, the, this doesn't work very well, and uh, it's much more uh, intensive in terms of complexity. 
and we have actually tried. This is the performance me measures. Um, it measures both the accuracy of the track here, as well as uh, the number of uh, speakers uh, you actually estimated. So it is a combined measurement actually. This is a popular um, metric that has been used in multi-object uh, tracking. So this is for random finding set. Um, this shows the result. And uh, this is uh, another sequence. And we didn't test, uh, this is the uh, average result for uh, this two speaker case, 2P, yeah? And for three speaker, it's, uh, it's much more uh, intensive in terms of the complexity, so we, we didn't test, actually. And, and as, as I said, the random final set, the uh, challenge is that the complexity uh, could be very high because this is the number of measurements and the number of speakers or number of targets. So depending on how many uh, targets you are dealing with, this can go, uh, can increase quite sharply if you have uh, many more targets that you wish to track. And for uh, PhD filter, this is the first order approximation of the random final set, which the, the order is, in, is linear with respect to the number of speakers. Okay. So the, uh, the idea is actually similar to, for example, in, in particle filter. Uh, there are two ways to, uh, to track the speakers using the uh, PhD filter. Basically, um, you, for example, you, you, you start with somewhere, like uh, you have the survival particles, and uh, also you have the spawn particles. You can draw the uh, particles, and then you assign the weight. And then you actually evaluate in a similar way as in the particle filter uh, uh, techniques. And then you actually um, check whether there are uh, new speakers coming based on the information you have. For example, you could use um, either use the uh, visual information directly from the image frame or the acoustic recordings to determine whether there's a new speaker coming in. And then you can generate uh, new particles corresponding to the new speaker's states. And, uh, and then the initially, the, new, the, the state of the new speakers can be uh, uniformly assigned, the weight. And then later, you can uh, uh, update all the weights um, based on the um, observations that you collected from the data. Okay? So the general idea is actually is, is quite similar to the uh, particle filter. Um, here, we're using this uh, sequential Monte Carlo uh, implementation of the PhD filter. Um, so, but the difference, uh, because here, we, again, we're using audio information. Um, if you're using audio video information, what you normally do is uh, you uh, randomly, uh, you know, generate some uh, particles, for example. It's just like you scan in the image which position could be uh, the target, right? Um, but because you don't know exactly uh, which direction the target is coming from. It could be working from this direction to here, or it could be from working to from here to here. So what you normally do is you uh, create some particles in a certain area. Here we only uh, in this rectangular area because uh, you know the speakers uh, usually have a certain height, right? You don't have to scan in a whole image. If you scan in a whole image, the complexity is even higher. But in this case, we only scan in a certain uh, box area here. But this is still not uh, as effective. If you have uh, audio information, then you could uh, you know, only search, for example, this certain area. It could be the uh, intersection between <coughs> this rectangle uh, box with the uh, DOA9. Because the DOA9 is provided by the audio information. So you don't have to uh, search the whole image frame in order to find uh, the new speakers, okay? So this shows the complexity if you do it in this way. Um, the complexity is actually even lower as compared with you do 
uh, in the original uh, using the original PHE uh, algorithm. So this shows the track result. This for two uh, speaker case. And this is for three speaker case. All right, speaker case, okay, they come in. There, there are sound actually, it's not played here, but there, there are sound because they are working at the same time they are speaking. So here we show the, uh, the result. This is the tracking errors uh, with respect to each uh, image frame. This is an image frame number, and this is shows the sequence number. Yeah, and you can see that uh, using audio, you could get you know noia errors. Um, and this is the average result for what the sequence, the sequence we tested here. And okay. Uh, and one of the issues, as I said, that uh, the uh, pH filter is an approximation of the random finding set. The ra random finding set, uh, you know, uh, it could give you uh, better accuracy, but uh, the com complexity is quite high. So for larger number of uh, speakers, you have to use a pH filter. This uh, comes with some uh, sacrifice in terms of uh, tracking accuracy. And uh, one of the main focus here is to try to improve the original uh, PhD filter algorithms um, at the same time um, with uh, uh, you know with a reasonable uh, complexity so what we did is we uh, we actually we used uh, some ideas from mean shift uh, so how mean shift works um, mean shift basically is uh, uh, this is an intuitive uh, explanation about the idea so for example if you want to find the den density uh, regions here. What you do is uh, you can, uh, you know, uh, you know you can create um, region of interest, and then you can evaluate. Um, this is so-called center of the mass. Yeah, you can estimate the center of the mass, and then you can, can compare with this is the center you know, of in, uh, of the region, and uh, and then you move the center of the region to. Uh, the center of the mass, this gives you the mean shift vector, yeah? You keep doing this. Um, the next step, you do the same thing, yeah? And then you keep going until you uh, find the densest region uh, that you're looking for, yeah? This, for example, in the speak tracking that, uh, this gives you the, uh, where the target is. And uh, if you compare the difference between the particle filter, PG filter, and the mean shift. The mean shift is based on the ob optimization techniques. It's not a statistical framework. So it's just uh, create a cost function, and then you measure and try to minimize the cost function, yeah? Using some techniques like gradient or whatever techniques you are using. And the mean shift is originally proposed only for single target tracking. And another limitation for mean shift is that uh, is not adaptive to the scale of the target you uh, wish to track. Some target could be small, some target could be large. So, but if you compare this technique with a PhD filter and a particle filter, then you will find that actually in PhD filter or uh, particle filter, we are tracking the state vector where which includes both the position of the target as well as the velocity, as well as the the scale of the target, S, yeah? We have that uh, parameter there, so which means in the state vector we are, we are actually tracking all this information. So this is uh, naturally provided by this algorithm, so, so which means that they can naturally address this issue, but at the same, ti at the same time, the mean shift actually, uh, using the mean shift technique, you can uh, more quickly find, for example, the local peaks in the distribution. So as we are uh, explaining, later. Of course, one of the uh, limitation of uh, uh, mean shift is that if you have a settled point in the distribution, then they might not be able to 
find which one is the one you're looking for. But this could be nicely addressed by the particle filter or PhD filter because you use multiple particles. And uh, what you do is, uh, it's like uh, if you apply this to particles, then the particle is already uh, propagated to different positions. And then in the end, it's like uh, you are uh, evaluating uh, multiple particles in the end. The even you have the set point, they should be able to converge to the correct local uh, maxima that you wish to uh, to find in the distribution. So this is a, so which means that by using mean shift together with uh, the PhD and the uh, particle field, uh, uh, it can address some issues in both techniques. And here I explain the concept. It's like a, okay, if this is the initial particles. Okay, this is incoming measurements. This is the initial weight. Okay, they are equal. And uh, if you have the measurement like this, then you come up with the weight. So this is a, uh, the weight, of course, is determined based on, for example, the butt shear coefficients or butt shear distance, depending on how you calculate. This actually uh, measures the similarity between the, uh, the, the information you take from the position of the particle and compare with some template, for example, which give you the, uh, the probability how likely you know, that uh, particle position that has uh, attacked it. So this, this, this is the weight, you know, after you take, after you get in this um, measurement information, then you modify the weight. This gives you um, different weight. And, but if you use mean shift iteration, then you can actually potentially uh, shift these particles towards the local peaks here. This gives you a better fit to the measurement that you, actually you, 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 you get. So this, this is essentially the idea. I mean, after you, you do this, uh, you get weight uh, something like this, I mean, which means that you can increase the weight if it's uh, close to the uh, local peak of the distribution. And uh, this is a um, tracking result. I, I better to look at this figure. So this shows the uh, tracking errors, and uh, it can actually improve uh, upon the previous uh, uh, PhD filtering uh, algorithms. Okay, here we used uh, we used the uh, audio wave information. This is the audio information for the, the original uh, SMC PhD filter. But one of the issue here is that uh, actually when you apply the mean shift process to each of the particles, it also introduce some uh, extra computational uh, cost. So we have also taken a step further uh, by doing so-called sparse sampling. So what we do is uh, we are not actually applying the mean shift to each of the particles because this could be a computationally quite uh, uh, intensive if you do that. This is the idea we we're using the idea similar to what have already discussed in KRD sampling. Uh, where assume you have the 10 particles, we calculate the partial coefficients and then we actually assign them to uh, a pin, you know, a number of pins. Here we are using 10 pins, the same number as the number of particles. And then you can actually based on the this number of beans, you can assign something like the, the probability uh, intervals. And uh, you then calculate the uh, budget coefficients. This <coughs> give you the uh, probability or the how likely these particles contain the information from the target. I mean, if it's higher, which means it's more likely that uh, you have a target in this particular position. So this gives you the um, partial coefficient for each particle, okay? And then you can assign these particles to these probability intervals. And finally, you get these kind of allocations of the particles to these multidimensional beams. And, um, and then what you do is uh, you can use the uh, KRD sampling, the technique we used uh, earlier to calculate the number of particles that we need to use to represent uh, you know, the distribution 
here. I mean, this is the number of beans B we're using, and uh, this is the quartile that uh, uh, we're going to use. So based on these parameters, you can figure out, uh, for example, in this case, what should be, uh, in this case, B is equal to 6, because there's 6 um, non-zero uh, intervals, or 6 uh, non-zero, yeah, with 1, which means that you have particles in that intervals. And then you can figure out, based on these 6, you can figure out the number of particles we, that you need to use to rep represent the distribution. Uh, this is uh, the number of particles you, I mean, without losing, uh, significantly losing the information. Yeah? So finally, uh, you only need to use, for example, five particles in the, you know, in these intervals. Because we have ranked, actually we have ranked the, the uh, probabilities from high to low. So if the, the particles coming into these intervals, it's likely to have more information about the target. So we also further uh, sampled that we only use one particle for each of these intervals. And this is the final result if you compare with the earlier one. So the performance is very similar to the one we used just now, uh, mean shift plus PhD filter, but uh, the performance is very similar. But in terms of the commutation of seven, it's much higher. If you apply the uh, mean shift to the SMC PhD filter for each particle, then the complexity is much higher. But if you use the sparse sampling techniques, then the complexity is still a bit higher, but uh, not that significantly higher. But you, in, in terms of performance, it's very uh, similar to um, the mean shift uh, SMC PhD filter. Okay. So th this is the average performance for all the sequences. Okay, that's all uh, quite quickly, I mean, quite intensively, even though I haven't uh, go, gone to the each details, especially in the PhD filter one. Um, but basically, we have uh, um, presented, uh, you know, lower uh, particle filtering algorithms for audio-visual tracking. Uh, as well as uh, um, uh, new techniques for um, audio-visual PhD uh, filter tracking. So we have uh, discussed uh, the problems or the limitations of uh, particle filter and uh, PhD filters, and then uh, try to improve them um, uh, based on these techniques, okay? And you can see that uh, there are some improvements in terms of uh, the tracking accuracy, but there also computational complexity issues uh, involved. So, um, future research could include, um, for example, extending the audio detection algorithm, uh, self-calibration, for example, we have used uh, the calibration information in the tracking system. But in, in practice, if you use for next like, outdoor or some other scenario, indoor robot tracking, uh, then how to calibrate that? And if the camera is moving, um, how to address that issue, uh, that could be an interesting problem. Here we assume we know that, that where the cameras are and where the uh, microphones are. So, so this information is already there, you can use. But if you have a mobile platform, uh, that could be more difficult. Um, online learning, um, you could also use more cues. Here we simply use the color cues, actually. Uh, uh, HSV cues. We, we, we didn't use much um, or other features from image frames. For audio, we only use one type. But here we are demonstrating that uh, this kind of framework could be very useful. It's, it's generic, actually. You could easily incorporate other information into the system. And uh, you could use uh, multiple cameras. Here we only use one camera, even though there are three cameras, but each time we use one camera plus the microphone array, okay? And uh, real-time implementation and, uh, and modeling more information about the indoor environment. This could be all interesting directions for future work. So here are the publications. If you want to know the details about the algorithms, uh, the implementation, 
and uh, we have provided uh, the source code for both papers on the website so you can have a look and test if you like okay thank you thanks for your attention